We live in a world where most of the products that we consume or use are made in a factory. In most factories, they use an assembly line. An assembly line is a series of workers and machines by which a succession of identical items are progressively assembled. In the capital city of Jackson, Mississippi, we had an incredible assembly line of coaches. Coaches like Anna Jackson, Wayne Brent, Luther Riley, and Thomas Billups, who helped make some of the greatest basketball players this state has ever seen. Players like James Hollywood Robinson, Mo Williams, Juanita Ward, and Monte Ellis, just to name a few. Where were these players assembled and made? At a place we call the JPS Basketball Factory. was a standout at Murrah High School, left Murrah and went to Northeast Community College, stopped by Alcorn State but finished at JSU where he was the SWAT player of the year, number one scorer in the country at 28 points a game, led Jackson State to an NCAA tournament, played four years in the NBA along with several years overseas, and now he is the associate head coach at Jackson State University. Please welcome Clinton Trey Johnson. <laughs> Ev, I appreciate that, man. Trey, what's up, man? Listen, we've heard a lot of just interesting things about JPS from different people. Uh, talk to us about your early experiences uh, at Murrah High School and at JPS. And I know you started out, you, you, you said at Lanier, you know, talk to us a little bit about that and then, you know, how you transitioned over tomorrow. So, uh, an interesting story. I grew up, I hated Murray High School. I was a Lanier Bulldog from the time I was probably about five or six up until I was 15. Um, my dad taught at Lanier. Uh, he started out at Whitten, but very early on, he, he became a shop teacher. They still had shop in school, he was a shop teacher and baseball coach at, at Lanier. So as a kid, I mean, that's what I knew was Lanier High School. So Jerry Nichols was Michael Jordan to me. Like, I watched Jerry Nichols growing up and I thought he was the best thing I ever seen in my life, play basketball. And then so on after that, I saw Shannon Long, TJ Billups, Corey Mangum, Mike Neal, uh, Adrian Hatchett, Antoine Ellis, PJ Gaylor. I mean, I saw all these guys come through there, James Thomas. I was in school, I was a ninth grader at James Thomas, 11th grade year. I was a ninth grader at Lanier, Darius Rice. So I hated Ronnie Henderson. I hated Othello Harrington, Jesse Pate, because they used to dominate Lanier. And I, every time you go to the game, Othello Harrington dunked every time he got the ball. So I, I, like it made me cry when they used to beat Lanier. I was a kid, so I used to cry when, they, when Lanier would lose to, to Murrow. So the transition was kind of more so my brothers, idea. Um, we grew up baseball players. My dad, you know, obviously played about seven or eight years minor league baseball in the Red Sox organization. So he was also the baseball coach at Lanier. So my brother, who was older than me one year, went to Lanier ninth and 10th grade, played baseball for my dad. I came as a ninth grader, played varsity baseball for my dad. My dad decided he wanted to go back to school, uh, get another degree and go into administration. So he was leaving Lanier after my ninth grade year. I was cool with staying. I wanted to stay. Uh, my brother wanted to, he only played one sport. I played all three sports. So he wanted to find another place where they had a pretty good baseball program in the city. Um, so, you know, we actually kind of went on visits as high school kids. Uh, he couldn't have paid me to go to Callaway. I'm sorry, I wouldn't have did that. Um, but they had the best, they probably had the best baseball program outside of us in the city at the time. But it was just something that I was like, nah, I'm not doing that. And Murrah was just more familiar. Um, most of the kids we went to middle school with, went to Murrah. So my brother wanted to make that move more so for a baseball decision. He was my ride to school, so I made the move as well. Wow, it's interesting. You know, uh, 
that that's a great, you know, that's something that we just didn't know, and that that was interesting. You said you played three, all three sports, so you played football as well. I played football, baseball, and basketball as a near. What position did you play in football? I was a quarterback. I started three games as a ninth grader varsity. Oh, okay. How did you do in them three games? It was two and one. I threw more interceptions than touchdowns, though. <laughs> what made you uh, decide to stick with basketball over football? I hated practicing football. You think about how hot it is right now. Think about two days in August. And I was, I was a young ninth grader. I graduated high school at 17. So when I entered, when I walked in Lanier High School, I was 13 years old. So, you know, I was young. I really didn't know much about how to work. I, I knew how to work, but I didn't know, you know, how to push through a threshold or, you know, I'm walking in there with 16, 17, 18 year old guys from Georgetown, you know, and I'm 13 years old. I got a two parent household when most of them didn't, didn't have. So, you know, I had to grow up quick from that standpoint, you know, and, and it helped me big time. By the time I, ninth grade, I couldn't, even, when I walked in the door at Lanier, I couldn't even, I could barely lift the bar on bench press. By the time I finished my ninth grade year, I was repping 45 easy. But uh, I mean, and that was a credit to just the people that were around me at Lanier, um, my friends, you know, the, the, the teams I played on and just the staff in general. Well, talk to me. Okay, so we transitioned over to Murrah. So did you play at Lanier for Coach Billups? Were you, were you? Uh, I was on the ninth grade team. So at the grade. time, my man DT was our coach. I don't know if y'all remember DT. Uh, uh, but DT used to walk on his tiptoes. <laughs> and he was full of energy. And you can't call him DT, so Coach Thompson was our coach. Um, but only the adults called him DT. But uh, Coach Billups was, you know, varsity, was a varsity coach. But I used to be the ball boy ninth grade. You know, so if you played ninth grade, then most of the time you would be a manager for the high school. And I had already been around, like I said, I grew up on the near, so I had been around for forever. So I, I've been knowing Coach Billups since I was a, a little boy. So then we shift over to Murrah. Uh, talk to us about that, now going from ninth grade team to the varsity team. Who were some of the uh, players that you had to look up to at that time, your sophomore year? Who was the leaders of Murrah at that time? So another fun fact, I did not play basketball my 10th grade year when I got to Murrah. I only played baseball. I stopped playing football and basketball. My 10th grade year was the only year that I only played baseball. Um, wasn't really... For whatever reason, when I got there, I just wasn't as, as interested in, in going for the basketball team. And at the time, Coach Frith, who, who just passed away, was my high school coach, uh, rest in peace. Murrah was kind of synonymous for you couldn't just show up and get on the team. Like, they didn't have tryouts. They didn't, coach didn't do those type of things. So it was like, man, I don't even really want to go through all that and, and, and try it. So I just stuck with baseball for that year. And, and I didn't even play basketball until my junior year. Again, no tryouts. I was friends with most of the basketball players. Julius Brown, who was um, a player at, at Murrah, we were the same age, same grade, but his dad was the assistant coach at Murrah. He had been the assistant coach even under uh, Coach Jordan. But uh, Coach Brown played at Lanier, um, won a high school national championship, I want to say 55 or 56, um, you know, a, a legendary team. but. He took me to Coach Brown's class one day and, and told Coach Brown that, hey, you know, this Trey, he want to play basketball, knowing that Murray don't have trials. And Coach Fritt really didn't just let new guys on the team. And so I was already in seventh period gym class because I was a baseball player. So we all were in seventh period gym. Coach Brown just told me to just come tomorrow, bring my stuff, and when they play open run, just, just play. I, I'll take care of it. And that's how I got on the team my junior year. I just went played open run. Coach Fritt didn't say anything to me. He just never told me to leave. So when they gave out a uniform, I got a uniform. So it was never like a formal conversation or anything like that with Coach Fritt. It was just Coach Brown told me to just dress out that day and play, and that's how I got on the team. Wow, that's incredible because, you know, as you went on to play, you know, professional basketball, if we look back at the story, you know, everybody had, here's the story, the mythical story of Michael Jordan didn't make the, the varsity team. You know, he got cut. In reality, he just played JV. <laughs> right. Know, everybody uses that story <laughs> like he got cut. You literally did not play basketball. That is different. You, like, and you were a conversation away 
from never playing basketball in high school. That's amazing. And so that's an incredible story. When did you know that, man, you know, I'm pretty good at this basketball thing? Interesting, I always felt like I was good. I was the kid in, in elementary that, when the teacher asked what you want to be when you grow up, whatever season it was, that's what my answer was. If it was football season, I'm gonna be an NFL player. If it was basketball season, be an NBA player. If it was baseball season, be a major league baseball player. But I really believed that. I really thought that. So I thought I was pretty, I was at least average in every sport. Um, it wasn't until, I remember my junior, I remember this like yesterday. It was my junior year. I was on the team, we were in the season. We would always shoot around before practice. I'm shooting around on one of the goals. And I just kind of was looking up at the wall. Our gym looks exactly like this gym. It's just polar opposite. Uh, and I just said, I want to go to the NBA. To myself, in my head. I knew it was going to take a lot of work. I knew it was going to be far-fetched, but I, it was just at that moment I made up in my mind that I was going to be married to whatever it took to get there. And from that point, I mean, that's what I did. I always was a student of whatever game I played. So my IQ was something that kind of set me apart more so than, than the next player that may have been more athletic or more gifted than me physically. But um, I just knew it was going to be a lot, but I was, I was willing to do whatever it took to get there. You know, I, I had done some research on you and you kind of triggered something. Whatever season it was, that's what you, your thought process. Correct me if I'm wrong, when you left high school, you were the, when you were a 30th round draft pick? I was in, a, in Major League Baseball? Yeah, so I was a 30th round draft pick for the Kansas City Royals out of high school. What made you choose, like, basketball over baseball? Man, it was just the love. Uh, I grew up playing baseball, so, I mean, I, baseball was my first love, but uh, anybody that knows my, my pops, <laughs> it was like a job early on. You know, you would be on punishment for bad baseball games. So. It just got to the point where I kind of got burnt out on it, um, you know, because I had been, it felt like I had been playing baseball for 15 years and working. It was a job, but basketball was just, you know, everybody around me was doing it. Um, and it was just a passion. It was just a burning desire. And I'm kind of the guy that like, I like to prove people wrong. So, you know, basketball was probably the last sport that anybody would have said that I would have played professionally. It probably would have went baseball, football, and then, basketball, so I, it was just like a challenge. Let's go back to your senior year in high school. Uh, were you the leader of that team, of your senior year? I was. You and who else? Man, we had 10 seniors that year. Uh, so our entire, outside of myself, uh, nine of our 10 seniors, so excluding me, they came in and played ninth grade together, so they grew up together. Um, but I mean, everybody, we had a very, very good team. We, Jeremy Cable, uh, Julius Brown, Julius Young, who played with me at Jackson State, uh, Justin Strader, Channing Twiner, Kevin Bass. Like, I mean, we had a well-rounded basketball team. Uh, we're number one in the state for the majority of the year. End up losing the first round. I'm still, I'm still sick behind that. Would you say, you know, because I, I saw you how your demeanor changed, would you say that's your most disappointing loss as a, as a high school player? Most definitely. We, we had just, Clinton was the preseason number one. They had the top player in the state, Jerika Singleton, at the time. Uh, we were preseason ranked number 10, and we was only ranked because of what Mo had did previously. No, we didn't have a top 100, or we just had a group of guys that, that could really play. Um, nobody was head above heels better than the next guy, but we just had a group of guys that, that really knew how to play together and had a lot of chemistry. And so by the time the season was over, we were number one and Clinton wasn't ranked anymore. Um, we had just beat them the previous week, the last game of the regular season. They were in our district. And so uh, we get through with district. We lose a, a game in district championship that we shouldn't have lost. So that put us on the road for what they call a satellite game. And we had to go back to Clinton and play. And they played this slow down, hold the ball game. And we just was, we were out of sync. I mean, we, we used to like to get up and down. I mean, our first four games of my senior year, we scored over 100 points in 32 minute games. So, you know, they, they slowed it down, held the ball. I think the score was 40 something, 30 something. 
final, but I mean, they beat us. And, and I, that one still stings. I, I won't let that one go. You know, you played a year with Mo Williams, is that correct? Correct. Okay, Mo was a senior, you was a junior. Talk to me, you know, you end up at, first of all, you go to Northeast after, you know, after leaving Murrah. What happened? Did you feel that you were good enough to play at those power five schools? And, you know, they obviously came in to see, you know, see Mo the year before. Talk to us how you ended up at Northeast versus maybe a power five or anything like that. Uh, number one, I, I didn't play basketball AAU wise. I played maybe two or three tournaments my whole life. Um, so that's where you were heavily recruited, obviously. And then uh, just, I was a power forward in high school. You know, I was about the same height, 6'4", six, 6'5", six, but I played power forward position. And so I knew I needed to transition into being a guard. God rest his soul, Omar Carter took me over after my senior year in high school. He actually is the one that sent me to Northeast and told me, you know, you need to show, you need to be a wing. From the time my senior year was over in high school, I worked out with Omar every day. And so by the time I showed up to campus in August, I was a, I was a wing. And the coach just trusted and believed him that, hey, this guy gonna be a wing, he gonna be a steal. Just if you got a scholarship to take him. And he, and he did and, it, and everything worked out. So then you leave Northeast, go to Alcorn. What happened there? Sam West happened. Uh, <laughs> anybody that knows Coach West, he can sell you a dream like fried ice cream. Uh, <laughs> but I love Coach West, great dude, but half of my family is Alcorn, half is Jackson State. As a kid, I grew up on the side that was Jackson State. My dad went to Jackson State, my uncles. So I, I hated Alcorn growing up. My granddad and my mom's side were all Alconites. And my brother was more the Alcorn fan. So Coach West came to me, I was a qualifier at high school, he came to me after my freshman year in JUCO and he just sounded so good. <laughs> and, and so I talked to my granddad about it. My granddad found out about it. And then he gets behind it. And so I said, all right, cool, I'm gonna go to Alcorn. Then I decommit. I commit to him and then I changed my mind. I said, nah, I don't want to do that. I'm going to go back to JUCO. So I spent the whole summer decommitted from Alcorn. I'm going back to Northeast for my second year. Coach West calls me the day before school starts. I have, I'm, the day before, I'm leaving that day to go to Northeast, to go back, check in my dorm. School starts that Monday. This is Sunday. Coach West calls me one last time. And again, <laughs> he just made it sound so good. I flipped and just... Went, went to Alcorn for a year. And I mean, it was, it was good for me. Um, it, it, it helped me grow into a man, uh, but I knew I needed to come home and, and be, be at Jackson State after I spent that year there. So you, went to, you came back to Jackson State, obviously had uh, a phenomenal career. You went on to be Swag Player of the Year. You averaged 28 points a game. And then you go on a journey, even though you were undrafted, you went on a journey and, and was able to make uh, several NBA teams, play for four years. Talk to us about how uh, JPS, uh, your time in JPS, shaped your ability to persevere and make it in the NBA. I mean, you hit it on the head. I mean, perseverance. Um, just being from Jackson in general, you know, you got to be tough. You know, nobody's giving you anything. And at the time I was coming up, I mean, the names I can name of guys in an open gym, like you had to be, have, you had to be great to even get on the court in an open gym. You're talking about Mo Williams, Justin Reed, Aaron Harper, Trey Lee, uh, Trey Sanders at, at Jim Hill. You know, I watched, you know, I spoke about the guys from Lanier, but I, I mean, I watched Roy Dixon play at Jim Hill, um, Dave Sanders, I mean, that's an open gym at the YMCA on a, on a Saturday. And so, you know, to get on the court with those guys, you had to be tough. To get their respect, you had to be tough. Um, you know, one thing for me, my, my barometer was if I had Jay Reed's respect, then I knew I was good. And from early on, you know, I, I, I sought after his respect because he was the toughest guy I'd ever seen, like from on the basketball court. So 
to watch him at his size. Uh, and a guy with most people would agree had limited ability, but he, he made the most out of everything he had. So it was just the toughness and the perseverance of being in the JPS atmosphere, you know, watching those guys that came before me. Um, I, I felt like I would be, I wouldn't be able to be mentioned with those guys' names if I gave up or I just gave in to any situation. Well, I'm Carlos Tanner. Um, I played basketball for Jim Hill uh, from 9th through 12th grade, uh, from uh, fall of 95 through spring of 99. Um, uh, and now I'm a lawyer in Jackson. Um, I practice law here, uh, and I've been back in Jackson since uh, about 2007. What, what years did you uh, play basketball? I played basketball at Jim Hill High School. I was a point guard uh, in uh, between 1996 and 1999. Uh, in 1996, I was a uh, point guard on the ninth grade team. And then uh, 97 through 99, I was a point guard on the varsity team at Jim Hill. I played with Trey Sanders, uh, who was a dandy dozen. My last two years in 98, 99. Roy Dixon, when I was in the ninth grade, Roy Dixon was a senior. He was a dandy dozen in all-state selection. Uh, played with Rod Beecham, uh, who was uh, not a dandy dozen, but he was a fantastic point guard. He was an uh, all-state honorable mention. Uh, but that's, that's who I came up behind, Rod Beecham, Reggie Smith, those guys. Oh, and of course, I can't forget to mention my, my classmate and teammate, Trey Sanders. So. Talk to you about uh, the legendary coach, Fred Harris. Fred Harris um, was a legendary coach in JPS, and um, you know one of the things that I recall uh, about Coach Harris, uh, my senior year, I was uh, 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 designated the star student at Jim Hill. That's a designation that uh, that they give out to all the schools in in Mississippi for the person who scores the highest in the school on the ACT exam. And along with the uh, star student designation, each star student gets to name uh, a star teacher. And I remember that year after getting named star student, um, even though I was in the IB program um, and had a lot of great teachers in IB, I was uh, very close with the people that were in administration. I named Coach Harris as, um, as the star, te star teacher that year. And uh, years later, uh, after I finished, had gone off and finished college, unfortunately, uh, Coach Harris met his untimely uh, demise. And I, me and everybody who had come through Jim Hill, who was around at that time, and even some people came back from out of state. And um, uh, that was in his obituary. And uh, I knew that it meant a lot to him that he had been named star teacher. And, uh, you know, Coach Harris was a whole lot more uh, to, to us over at Jim Hill than just a basketball coach. Uh, he was like a father figure to a lot of guys. And uh, even outside of, you know, I can tell you a lot about what it was like to play for Coach Harris. He taught us a lot of principles about, uh, that I still use to this day, about hard work, about discipline, about how to, how to win with class, lose with grace, um, and how to be a fighter. A lot of times during my time at Jim Hill, one of the things about our teams was that you know, we didn't have a lot of tall guys. We were short and scrappy. And, uh, you know, Coach Harris, you know, really preached to us hard work and what it was like to, you know, to see how he built cohesive teams. I mean, you know, we, you know, guys who played for Coach Harris, we're friends to this day. We've been to parents' funerals of each other. We've been to, you know, uh, sent flowers to hospitals for, you know, births of children, that kind of thing. We were each other's uh, godfathers to each other's children. And uh, that's the kind of thing that uh, Coach Harris instilled in us. And if you don't, if you don't mind, I'd like to, uh, aside from me playing and being associated with uh, Coach Fred Harris's teams, uh, there was something that I thought was special, not just about being a Jim Hill Tiger uh, in the late 90s. Um, I think there's a bigger issue um, that I observe about JPS, Jackson Public Schools basketball as a whole. It's easy, and I've seen reports to talk about all the wins that Coach Wayne Brent from Provine had, all the championships he won. I can talk about uh, Coach Arthur Brown from Murrah and all the wins he had, the successful players he had come through his program. 
I can talk easily about Coach uh, Billups, Thomas Billups from Lanier. And you can look at old newspaper clippings and see those accolades. What you're not going to see um, that's probably, you know, more to their credit, how many guys came through Lanier uh, that Coach Billups helped keep off the streets? How many guys came through Provine out of West Jackson that Coach Brent uh, made sure had counseling on issues that had nothing to do with bouncing a ball up a court? I know firsthand how many guys, um, you know, owe their very being here right now, uh, living successful lives, not uh, succumbing to a lot of the pressures that were going on in and around Jim Hill and West Jackson to Coach Harris, you know, stepping up being a father figure for a lot of guys. And um, I think those are the kinds of things that people aren't going to notice. It's easy to just talk about wins on a basketball court, but that's the kind of stuff, you know, that get guys like Coach Harris into heaven, you know. Carlos, you know, we, we talked about uh, Coach Harris, and, and uh, he was a mentor to me during that time. Yes, sir. You know, and he not only meant a lot to the basketball team, but he meant a lot to the whole school. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a, as an attorney, um, you know, I, I remember uh, some of the things that you can kind of the toughness that you had to have on, on the Coach Harris team. I know because he he told me Coach Harris and Mr. John will come through the door. That's where I'm a coach. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to coach them up and we're going to go out there and we're going to compete. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you didn't have a bunch of tall guys, but you had guys that were ready to fight when mm -hmm. they hit the court. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of talk to me about that attitude and how it's paid off into what you're doing now. Coach Harris, um, he used to always stress. I mean, he would joke with us. It didn't matter who you were, whether you were the, the dandy dozen star shooting guard or the, or the, 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 the guy pushing the broom before uh, cleaning up the court before we started. He would say, I didn't ask any of y'all to come here, you know? He's like, I, I play the hand I'm dealt. And um, what that spoke to me, uh, even back in those days, is the kind of ethics that Coach Harris had. He wasn't gonna color outside the lines. He didn't care who lived at what residence, you know, and was playing elsewhere. He wanted to play the, with those that were at our school and wanted to play on the team and were gonna do what he demanded of us. And so, that kind of ethics, um, you know, having your own personal constitution and not breaking it or bending it for anybody. I mean, that's what I carry with me to this day. I mean, one of the funny things about lawyers is people assume, um, you know, if you got a successful track record being a lawyer, that you must be a good liar. Um, but I, I, I teach law school classes now. I lecture around the state, outside the state. and. Uh, to defeat that notion, a lot of times I tell people I've gotten a whole lot farther with juries, with prosecutors, when I've been on the defense side. And uh, when I was a prosecutor, I get a lot further telling people the truth and putting stuff in context than I ever would off a lie. Um, and so uh, it was the way Coach Harris carried himself. Um, uh, and then I feel like he and I had a real special relationship at the time. Um, you know, early on, of course, naturally, we talked a lot about basketball and what my job was on the court and what my job was in relation to the, the teammates I had. Um, but the thing about Coach Harris is he knew what my primary path to success was. He talked to me more about academics and achievement in the classroom and enrichment activities. Uh, he's the one that encouraged me to go off to Duke for academic camp. Uh, after my sophomore year rather than a basketball camp uh, that I had been invited to participate in. So it was that kind of thing about Coach Harris and his priorities and, you know, making sure the first thing was first, so to speak, um, that really stuck with me. Uh, how does um, what you do as an attorney, uh, are any of those skills related from uh, being a point guard for so many years? I know and I, if I remember right, you didn't shoot a lot of balls. That's and true. You didn't score a lot of points. Right, right, right. But your job was to set everybody else up. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing about my, um, uh, I, I think it definitely relates. First and foremost, it doesn't matter who scores the most points. Point guard, like a quarterback uh, in football, you, you're a leader. The position is built around leadership. You're setting a tone each and every time up and down the floor, and uh, you're directing everybody. 
I mean, you might be able to shoot better than me, but I'm putting you in the spots that you need to get to to be able to shoot your most effective shots. It's about clock management. It's uh, about playing good defense, making sure you're a floor general. And uh, that's what I've tried to be in my uh, legal career. Um, you know, those things, it's about systems, understanding, you know, everybody's role and making sure everybody stays within their lanes. You know, even though I'm the point guard, I got to know that my four man, he's not the shooter, but he's got to be in the position to get rebounds. So I might direct the floor based on that. And so uh, that's a lot of what I do here. I mean, you got to know what plays to to run and what situations. So in my role as a lawyer, and especially as a person that operates my own uh, practice, the big thing is having systems in place. I mean, and any anybody who was ever an athlete or a coach knows, I mean, for every hour on the court, that's days and weeks of practice. And that that's a similar thing. I mean, I'm, I'm really known for being a good uh, courtroom lawyer. And so people see the courtroom stuff, but they don't know. It's a whole lot of reading, a whole lot of all-nighters that go into, you know, the, the one hour of success in the courtroom. So, I mean, it's a lot of that kind of stuff that was planted in, in me early, uh, particularly during my time at Jim Hill. Talk to me about some of the uh, competitors or, or best players you played against in Jackson during that time and also some of the best teams that you played against during that time. Well, you know, it was interesting. Uh, my senior year, we ended up uh, at the big house and, um, you know, for the state playoffs. Uh, and we were two games out from the championship game. And, you know, one of the comments that we would get was our record. Because I think by the time we got to the state coliseum, we were 20 and 12, uh, which was not like most of the other folks that were down there. The problem is, again, going back to the point about JPS basketball, eight of those 12 losses were to Provine and Lanier. And so, you know, uh, those guys were tough, you know. And uh, if you look at the dandy dozen, I remember my last uh, two years at, uh, at Jim Hill, I think probably, I mean, you got the whole state of Mississippi, 84 counties, but, um, or 82 counties or whatever it is, but half of the dandy dozen were right here in JPS. I mean, Provine had an amazing squad. Lanier, I mean, you know, uh, they were a powerhouse. And uh, that year, even though we made it to the state, those were the two teams that ended up in the state championship. And uh, I remember those guys well. It was funny because in high school at Provine, you had Kamari Ballard. That were my year. You had Kamari Ballard and Otis Gaines. Um, and they were competitive on their own team, but we were competitive vis-a-vis uh, -vis each other. The same with Lanier. Uh, they had a point guard, real short like me, real tough, real strong guy, and had a somewhat similar game. He was uh, quick as a cat, didn't shoot much, but he was definitely a floor general, and that was uh, Cornelius Torrance. And it's funny, back in those days, you know, we bump into each other out at the mall, at parties, kind of give each other the side eye. Uh, but again, the thing about this uh, kind of a fraternity uh, that, that JPS basketball represents, we didn't speak much in high school because we had all these competitive battles, but years and years later, we've, we've become friends. Uh, Kamari Ballard's doing positive stuff in the community. He has a, a team that he's using, kind of like the same thing I was saying about Coach Brown, Coach Billups, Coach Brent, Coach, uh, Coach Harris. You know, he's using the vehicle of a basketball training uh, operation to mentor kids, to keep kids uh, in a positive lane. Um, you know, I barely talked to the man in high school, but he sent me a letter. I went to the mailbox one day, my P.O. box, opened it up. There was a letter in there asking me to support his team. I sent a check in. We weren't friends in high school. We were fierce competitors, but I was happy to support the man. Um, and the ladies the same way. Um, you know, look at Tamika Reed. I wasn't particularly close to Tamika Reed um, in high school. We were the same year. I was at Jim Hill. She was at Murrah. But her first year at Jackson State, I saw how she was like, I mean, I was proud to see how much she was kicking tail, so to speak. I hopped in her inbox and sent a, a, a message to her saying, hey, it's end of the year. I'm looking at charitable donations. If your girl's ball team needs a donation, I'm happy to support. Um, and I think you look at, uh, at, at what's going on at Jackson State right here in this community. I don't think it's an accident that another one of my uh, competitive uh, people uh, who also play point guard at Murr. Ashley Robinson is the AD over there. I don't think it's an accident that, uh, you know, 
awesome Tamika Reed and uh, and uh, newly uh, Mo Williams have been brought over there. I mean, all three of them were, you know, superstar basketball players in JPS. And now you look, I mean, 25, 30 years plus, everybody's working together. I mean, you know, that's the kind of support. Richard Bradley played for Murrah. We've been doing business together for years. Um, and I think it's important to say that in my legal career, uh, I think, uh, you know, other than the stuff I said that Coach Harris kind of instilled in me, nobody had a direct boost to my legal career uh, like Judge Henry, Henry Wingate. And one of the first things we bonded over was the fact that I was a point guard at Jim Hill and he had been back in the day, long, pro before I was living, uh, uh, an, an awesome point guard uh, uh, at Brinkley back when it was a high school. So, you know, um, and I understand from him that uh, he, he and Coach Brown, uh, who was coaching back when I was in high school, used to have legendary battles. Now, I'm sure Coach Brown would say something different about who used to come out on top, but, you know, one of the first things Coach, Coach uh, I mean, um, Judge Wingate and I bonded over was the fact that we were both point guards in JPS.